Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world coming up. There are currently 50 million people thought to be living in modern slavery, with women and girls particularly impacted. I'll be speaking shortly to Grace Forrest, the founder of Walk Free, on the need for a global effort to end this epidemic. And we also meet the women in Venezuela who've taken their own futures literally into their own hands and are building their very own family homes as the country confronts a housing crisis. But first, and it's estimated, some 50 million people are living in modern slavery. This includes millions in forced labour and forced marriage, with women and children being especially vulnerable. The Global Slavery Index, produced by the NGO Walk Free, reports that some 10 million more people have become slaves since 2018, and one in four of them are women. The massive spike in figures caused by factors such as an increase in conflict, climate-induced migration, the pandemic and not to mention a global rollback of women's rights. Joining me now in the studio is Grace Forrest, the founding director of Walk Free, an international human rights group focused on the eradication of modern slavery. Grace, thank you so much for coming in. I mean, that's a startling figure when you think about it, the number of people jumping by 10 million in the last uh, five years and as a result living in modern slavery. But let me start by asking you, what exactly constitutes modern slavery these days? So we're talking about the systematic removal of a person's freedom, where one person is exploited by another or a financial institution for personal or financial gain. So it's an umbrella term we use to describe a number of highly exploitative practices, including forced labour, forced marriage, debt bondage, human trafficking and state-imposed forced labour. And how many women and children are particularly impacted as a result? So of the overall figure, one in four is a child and women and girls represent well over 50% of our figure. I think to put this staggering figure of 50 million people another way, there are more women and girls living in modern slavery in the world today than there are people living in Australia. So women and, and girls are disproportionately impacted by every form of modern slavery except one, state-imposed forced labour. And for women and girls, this could be forced labour working as a domestic migrant worker across the Arab states. It could be a young girl forced into marriage as a result of the economic volatility felt throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And if I can give you two examples, one, in 2020, as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw Somalia try and re-legalise child marriage for children as young as eight years old, looking at the economic effect, the impact a family could have from a dowry. And we saw, you know, in my region of the world, in Indonesia, over a 50% increase in applications for child marriages. I think often in times of crisis, we forget that the first thing to go, because it is most fragile, is the rights of the woman and the girl. And too many times throughout the last five years, we have seen that happen on a backdrop of protracted conflict, on a backdrop of climate crisis, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in your uh, Global Slavery Index, you highlight 10 countries uh, which have the highest prevalence of modern slavery, and they include Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Russia, North Korea and Afghanistan. But the impact of modern slavery goes way beyond all of that, and we all are playing a role in all of this, aren't we? Yes. So the Global Slavery Index measures the prevalence of modern slavery across 160 countries. And I think I'd, I'd like to start by pointing out that over 50% of the people living in that 50 million figure are living in G20 countries. This is not a problem that happens over there. It is actually happening on the shores of the world's most wealthiest nations. And on top of that, we're looking at almost half a trillion dollar import risk of the G20 countries of goods at high risk of being made using forced labour. This could be as close as the technology we're speaking on today, as the shirt on your back. And I think that of these products that we're measuring, it is as close as cotton in fast fashion that is being driven by rampant consumerism throughout the world and as urgent as solar panels, which for the first time is appearing in our top five products of exploitation vulnerability. This index, first and foremost, is a call to action for governments. We want to make that very clear. Governments, no government is effectively responding to modern slavery and businesses are creating vulnerability and compounding exploitation in their supply chains. But consumers can absolutely speak up about this. It's not OK that in 2023, most of us have 
no idea where our clothes are coming from. It's time that we put transparency and accountability as the rule, not the exception. Grace, we're just going to pause there for a moment because in the last 10 years, thousands of Ugandan women fly to the Middle East each month wanting a better salary to support their families. However, after complaints of abuse, assault and ill treatment, the Ugandan government last year said it would suspend its bilateral agreement with Saudi Arabia to review the treatment of its citizens. Our correspondents on the ground sent us this report. Like thousands of other Ugandans, Carol Namugaya is heading to Saudi Arabia. The 22-year-old will soon be earning twice as much as the average salary at home. I want to get as much money as I can to help my family and maybe start a business when I come back here. I will also be able to pay school fees for my brothers and sisters. Registered for the move, she had to wait till the end of March on the renewal of a labour export agreement between Uganda and Saudi Arabia. Jennifer, who used to work in Oman, is giving her a few pointers. They love kids so much, so if you find a family with kids, love their kids. If you love their kids, things will be well for you. Jennifer set up her own NGO to protect the rights of domestic maids. More than 80,000 Ugandan workers flew to the Middle East last year. Sometimes the jobs go horribly wrong. Jennifer registers hundreds of complaints of abuse a year. They all knew, like they all knew. The, the things of contract, they don't, they don't want to know. The man can force you to have sex when you refuse. He can throw you from the maybe fourth floor, then you die. Jennifer drove out to meet with one person, Rebecca, who talked about her experience of working in the Middle East for four years. There is no day off on the maids. You even work at night. You are not allowed to, be, to keep your passport. Like you're a prisoner. Because if someone takes your identification, you can do nothing about it. The government says its new agreement with Saudi Arabia provides greater protection. They need our workers. We also need to solve certain challenges, whether it's unemployment, whether it's stuff around uh, poverty issues. You're looking at medical insurance, repatriation, standard issues around uh, the welfare of a migrant worker in a, domestic, in a foreign country. The authorities' concerns are linked to significant revenue. Ugandans in the Middle East are sending around 900 million US dollars back home each year. And watching that report with me is Grace Forrest, the founding director of Walk Free. Grace, an example there of forced labour in the area of domestic work, especially in the Middle East. But it is also an example of what a government can do to deal with this problem. But does it go far enough? It does not go far enough. This index finds for the first time three Arab states leading globally in prevalence of modern slavery. And Saudi Arabia, the example we've just seen, has some 700,000 people living in modern slavery on its shores. This is a story absolutely of migrant worker exploitation under systems like kafala that legally tie these employees to their employers and strip them of their most basic human rights. We need to see these systems amended and we need migrant workers, whether it be in Saudi Arabia and across the Arab states where this is an increasing problem, but also in the United States, in Australia. We know that migrant workers throughout the world are three times more likely to experience forced labour than non-migrant workers. But this is a global epidemic. So basically what needs to be done, Grace? There are three key things this Global Slavery Index is calling for. First is around G20 responsibility. Without a doubt, the world's most powerful nations have the greatest responsibility in fixing this problem of modern slavery, both on their shores and in their global supply chains. It's not good enough that these economies are being built of exploitation throughout the world, and we are calling on the G20 to centre the eradication of modern slavery in their negotiations later this year. Secondly, this is a story of migration, distress migration and a need for work throughout the world. Migrant workforces are an essential and important part of our economies and it is time they're given their most basic respect and dignity by the countries who are meant to be looking after them and whose economies deeply rely on them. And thirdly, this global figure also includes forced marriage, which is a gro growing problem throughout the world. We need the legal minimum age to be lifted to 18 without exception as a starting point to protect women and girls' most basic human rights as a starting point. Grace Forrest, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Thank you so much. And finally to Venezuela.
And in a poor neighbourhood of Caracas, female teachers, beauticians and nurses have all turned their hands to construction. It's hard manual labour, but they're doing it for their independence and their families, as Antonia Kerrigan reports. There's a housing crisis in Caracas, but thanks to these women, 95 new homes are in the pipeline. Over eight years, they have become home builders and will soon be home owners. I bend ropes, I make moorings, we carry sand, we carry blocks, we carry cement. I feel really good about it and even more so because it is to get a house for my son, for my son's future. Most of them are single mothers and currently living in cramped conditions with relatives. It started with a government scheme to provide materials and technical guidance free of charge to first-time builders. Unpaid labour in return for a flat in the new Antimano development. The 80% female workforce wasn't planned. But over eight years, they have torn up the rule book in Venezuela's conservative patriarchal society. 17-year-old Luis helps out his mother on the building site, his mother who has become the on-site expert on reinforcement bars. It's the first time I've met a woman who is a rebar master, and I feel even prouder because she's my mother. I would never have thought that my mother would be a rebar master, nor that we would have this great opportunity to have a house, a home. But these women are not always met with the respect they deserve. People often say, here come the macho women, because they do this physical labor. I say no, I am completely feminine. The first two flats in the development will be finished this year, a major milestone for the project, whose progress has been marred by the pandemic, a dire economic crisis and the increased cost of building materials. And that's all for this edition. We'd love to hear your suggestions for the 51%, so do get in touch via Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, and you can catch our previous episodes on our website. So until our next show, bye for now.